Hello, in this video, I am going to talk about contrastive phonology, English and German phonology, and some implications for teaching English as a foreign language and the pronunciation of English to native speakers of German. Okay, as a reminder, I've said before in another video that phonemes are uh, these theoretical um, sound units that we have that can make a difference um, in what words mean and that they count only for one language. So each language has its own set of phonemes, right? To quote again from Collins and Mace, from the moment children start learning to talk, they begin to recognize and appreciate those sound contrasts which are important for their own language or languages. They learn to ignore those which are insignificant for their L1. This means that we have a potential problem here when people are um, learning a foreign language then uh, a bit later in life because they already have a native tongue and their L1, their native language, is, has already given them a sound system, a system of phonemes. So now this video will ask the question, so what does this mean for language teaching? And uh, particularly if we think about teaching English to native speakers of German. Right. Um, Collins and Mace go all the way back to 1992, in which Avery and Ehrlich um, wrote a uh, book introduction, um, which is sort of a foundational text um, when thinking about teaching the pronunciation um, of an L2. And they say, Avery and Ehrlich say, that um, when thinking about how much um, weight should be placed on phonology and on correct pronunciations in the teaching of a foreign language, that there are two very extreme and equally wrong um, opposing views. The one view to be mentioned here is that we absolutely need pronunciation drills to get rid of all traces of a foreign accent in the learners. The other equally wrong view is that teaching pronunciation is only really possible up to a certain age uh, anyway, and so you can basically forget about it. And of course, they say, well, um, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. The learners of this other language, L2 learners, um, might never reach perfection, but completely disregarding pronunciation does them a great disservice in uh, trying to learn this foreign language. So of course, pronunciation and teaching pronunciation is an important thing. They then go into biological, sociological, and so on uh, factors that play a role here. One thing um, that they mention that has been very influential is the so-called critical period hypothesis. This has something to do with biology and um, with um, how the way our brains develop. And the critical period hypothesis states that languages are learned differently by children and by adults, resulting from how uh, aged, how mature uh, the brain is um, at the moment um, in which a person is trying to learn a foreign language. Now, a lot of time has passed since 1992. There's been a lot more research, of course. Um, there have been a lot of advances in uh, brain science. And so this critical period hypothesis probably paints a picture that is much too simple. Um, and it's not really, yeah, you, you, you can't really say that it's just true like that. So uh, for one thing, we um, can say that adult learners do find it harder to get rid of their L1 accents than children do um, when they're trying to learn a language. But however, uh, some adult learners do it still achieve native-like perfection, so it's probably um, much more a thing of the individual um, person that we're looking at. Uh, so you can't really make uh, sweeping statements like this. So there doesn't really seem to be a time window of only a few years or something like that um, in which everybody's brain um, has this capacity and then it loses the capacity completely. It's really not as simple as that. But these biological factors do seem to play a role there. So it's also not completely 
uh, wrong. Okay, uh, moving on to social cultural factors and what this then means for um, the teaching of foreign languages. Um, the more strongly learners identify with members of the target language culture, the more likely they will be to sound like the members of that culture. Um, so this is an unconscious factor. Accent is an unconscious marker of social identity. And this really plays into the teaching of pronunciation quite a bit, I think. Um, this also means, however, that students might not be interested in sounding like native speakers if they don't really identify with the culture, if they see no sense um, in, uh, in trying to sound um, like a person from England because uh, maybe they um, are not even thinking about members of that culture in any positive way or something like that, then, well, this can also, um, well, it, it, it can mean a positive thing or a negative thing, of course, um, depending on uh, what people are thinking about the culture um, of the uh, speech community that they're, that they're aiming for, whose language they're trying to learn. So here, I think it's, it's um, important to set realistic um, goals when uh, teaching uh, pronunciation. Another thing are just personality factors, as they call it. Learners who are extroverted might have more opportunities to practice their pronunciation because they're talking all the time, right? And learners who are more introverted might lack the, these opportunities uh, to practice uh, practically their pronunciation of the foreign language. Here it's important for the teacher to create a non-threatening atmosphere in foreign language classrooms. Um, for example, no one should be forced to participate. That would be really bad. Um, so you have to sort of take care of the introverts as well. And um, that could also be another problem that comes in here. But the basic thing that I'm going to talk about in this video right now is just purely from a linguistic point of view right now. What is a foreign accent? Right? A foreign accent means um, if you're speaking a language with a foreign accent, it means that you have certain sound patterns that are coming from your L1 and that you're probably transferring some of these patterns to uh, the way you pronounce your L2. Now, this might have something to do with the inventory of sounds with the sounds that are available to you from your L1, quite simply. It may also have something to do with rules for the combination of sounds, possible combinations of sounds, possible um, consonant clusters, for example, or possible ways to begin a syllable or to end a syllable in your mother tongue. And there might be different rules there than in the language that you're um, learning now as an L2. And then lastly, also, um, there probably will be different stress rules, different typical intonation patterns, and so on. But what I'm going to focus on right now to keep it simple is just um, the sounds that are there or not there in the other languages, the inventory of sounds. For example, German has a different phoneme inventory and uh, different combination rules as well uh, than English. And by the way, this has effects on the production then. Um, if it, you, you're, we're talking about German students uh, learning English, um, but it also, and, and the way they pronounce English then, but it also has effects on the perception even of sounds in the L2. So maybe um, the problem, so to speak, also concerns which sounds the German-based uh, learners of English are able to hear, are able to distinguish when listening to somebody speak English. So it's not just production, actually. It's also perception where all of this plays a role. Okay, um, in another video, we already looked at all of the phonemes that exist in a standard accent of English. Now let's look at the phonemes as they exist in standard German. Um, I'm just going to read them out right now. Um, <laughs> just so uh, we know what we're talking about here. Okay, so in German, we have the following sounds. A, as in Bach. A, as in Saal. Ei, as in Heim. Au, as in Haus. B, as in Bach. Ch, as in Licht. Ch, 
No, sorry. <laughs> D, actually, as in Dach. Um, ch is coming up a bit later there. E, as in beat. E, as in bet. E, as in zag. By the way, this is not really um, a different phoneme from E in some accents of German today. I think what you see here concerns mostly Southern German. So in uh, more Northern accents of German, you would not have a difference between the E in beat and the E in Sieg anymore. But theoretically, um, at, or at least in some regional accents, you have beat, but then Sieg. Okay, let's go on here. Um, f as in fet. G as in gust, H, as in hoot, E as in lead. By the way, look at the transcription there. There's something coming up about that. I as in bit, Y as in jung, K as in kalt, L as in last, M as in must, N as in nest, and Ng as in jung. That one's a bit hard to pronounce in isolation. O as in lawn. O as in post. Ö as in schön. A rounded front vowel there, by the way, something that doesn't exist in English. Another one. Ö as in köstlich. Oi. As in hoi. I'm really wondering about the, tr the transcription there because the transcription looks more like o, right? But that's not how you pronounce that. So it's, it's kind of weird. Um, I would pronounce oi, actually. Hoi. With more of an e sound at the end. Uh, not rounded. Then p as in post. R as in rost. This one sounds very different from uh, English. It's still, we're still using the same symbol here. I guess that's because we're actually talking about phonemes. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's like a fricative, right? It's, it's really different um, in, in German. S as in riss. Sch as in schön. T as in tal. By the way, you already saw this in bild and lied at the end there. But t, we have the same sound at the beginning uh, in tal. Then U as in gut, O as in Kunst, V as in Welt. Look at the spelling there, right? There's another big difference to English. Um, ch as in Bach, by the way, ch in Bach, and what you saw at the very beginning, ch in Licht, I think are members of the same phoneme and uh, shouldn't really be kept apart on the phonemic level. Um, but maybe they're per perceptually different enough um, for uh, appearing in the list twice right here. Okay, we then have U as in Blüte, another rounded front vowel. And another rounded front vowel, Ö as in Hübsch. Z as in Saal. Now, the last three here in this list are very hard to pronounce. They're impossible to pronounce in isolation, really. But the final sound in Säge and the final sound in Fata and the initial sound in Alt. Okay, you might be wondering about that last one. What's the initial sound in Alt? It's not really the vowel. You have a consonantal beginning in a word like Alt. What's happening there, if I'm really pronouncing it the German way, is a sudden opening of the glottis. So a glottal plosive or a glottal stop um, is to be heard at the beginning of a word like alt. Um, this is never, uh, this never shows up in, in the written form in German. So it's, it's a thing that um, sometimes surprises people that it's actually there. Uh, but phonetically speaking, or phonologically speaking, I guess, um, it's there. Okay, so those have been the phonemes of Standard German. Um, what's most important for us right now, so for German speakers, speakers of German as an L1 who are trying to learn English, maybe the most important bits are not really the 
uh, funny things you see here, but the stuff that you don't see, so those, the stuff that is absent from this list, but that occurs in English, like the W sound, for example, or the TH sounds, um, we're getting to that, obviously, in this video. Another thing that might um, be important to look at are the slight differences. So the things that occur in both lists, the list of phonemes of English and the list of phonemes of German, and to think about do they really sound the same in both languages or don't they? An example, look at the third thing on the list here, um, is the vowel that we hear in German, Heim, really the same vowel that we hear in the English word to buy something, okay? Um, the transcription is the same, right? Heim, uh, to buy, is it really the same sound? Or is it possible to produce the English word to buy with a German accent? Yes, it is, right? I could say something like buy, right? And that would make it sound more German. But why, right? What's, what's the difference there? Um, and this is really uh, fun to think about then. Okay, however, uh, not every kind of error is the same. So um, teachers of English as a foreign language should only focus on the critical errors. That is the errors that um, really can make a difference and really um, can lead to misunderstandings, of course. So you should make learners aware of aspects of their pronunciation that make it harder to understand them. And by the way, there's a lot of YouTube videos about this, uh, about um, teaching English uh, to foreign speakers, where they focus on differences like I versus E, bitch versus beach. Of course, uh, you don't want to be misunderstood there. Um, by the way, this would be a difference that you see here um, that is not relevant for German because German has both, right? It has an I sound like in uh, uh, Finden, right? And it has an E sound like in Liebe. Um, so very much like, like English there. But this, for example, would be um, very relevant for speakers of Spanish as a, as a uh, mother tongue. So learners must be given the opportunity to practice crucial aspects of the English sound system, crucial from their point of view. So the differences that maybe their L1 doesn't make, but that English does make. Right, so there's hierarchies of errors. Let's begin with um, the category of errors that is not so important, just to mention that one time here. So we have um, what Collins and Mace call category one, very important, category two, slightly important, and category three, not so important. So category three would be errors that don't really uh, provoke um, reactions of irritation or mis misunderstanding, um, errors that might even pass unnoticed. So maybe there are intonation differences, uh, typically, between English and German. Maybe there are stress differences, but um, this can pass very unnoticed. Or, as I just mentioned with my example of to buy, um, versus German Heim, maybe vowels sound slightly different, but it doesn't really matter if you're realizing them the German way. Um, at least it doesn't lead to a breakdown of communication. Another example that you can find um, or that you can see here is the fact that the high front vowel E um, has a slightly different position, really. If you record people and you look, and you look at how are they uh, producing the sound E, um, in German and in English, it's not really the same vowel. They're, it's almost the same vowel, vowel but um, it's in a slightly different position, um, ideally, on the vowel chart. So I'm talking about the sound that you hear in German, Liebe, and the sound that you hear in English, to leave somebody, right? To leave something behind. Is it really the same sound or is there a slight difference there? But this is category three. These are the errors that don't really um, bother us too much. What really bothers us is category two, errors that evoke irritation or amusement. And then, of course, category one that you see here, errors that can lead to a breakdown of intelligibility. Now, for German speakers of English, what do we have in category one? We have the fact that English makes a difference between eh, as in bed, and a, ah, as in bad. And German has no such contrast between e eh and a. Ah. Um, this is really crucial. Then German um, 
has something we call final consonant devoicing. So the voiced versus unvoiced contrast. Let me uh, come up with another example. Uh, bed and bet. Right? Um, like, um, I, I bet he, he won't come. Right? Um, versus the word bed. There's a d there. And that's really hard to pronounce for German speakers of English. A voiced consonant at the end of a word. And then uh, German doesn't have a W sound. So the V versus W contrast is also very, very important um, in uh, teaching English as a foreign language or teaching English pronunciation. Then category two, what do we have for German um, speakers? We might come up against uh, what is called inappropriate articulations of the R sound. So R and uh, things like that. Um, depending on your accent of German, of course, you will probably have very different um, realizations of the R sound, um, very different from the English R that you often have in English accents, standard accents. Then the whole TH thing, right? So TH versus S and THE versus Z. German speakers of English are likely to, um, to replace the TH sounds with either S or z, depending on whether it's the um, voiced or unvoiced uh, dental fricative. Then the whole clear versus dark L thing um, will come up uh, in the next few slides. The lack of weak forms, the lack of contractions um, in German, or relative lack, if you compare it to English. And then just quite simply, inconsistent um, roticity versus non-roticity. So speakers of um, English as a foreign language who have a German uh, language background, um, they might think that they're aiming for an either either a rhotic uh, variety like general American um, accent or a non-rhotic accent of English like um, RP. But really what you hear a lot of the time is um, not so consistent. You either have the R there sometimes in a word like never, uh, but then it might be gone in a word like ever, right? And the, ever, and then it's just sometimes it's sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not there. So um, inconsistent use of that. So where does this come from? Let's focus on the on really on the differences between English and German, uh, between the between um, the con. Uh, sorry, the 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 um, phoneme inventories now. So in German there is no w simply doesn't exist in the German um, consonant, uh, consonants of German. You can see this, um, for example, uh, Charles Darwin, right? His name is, can be pronounced as Darwin in uh, German sometimes, or even Darwin, I'm putting that with, with an R here. Um, uh, yeah, it can be replaced uh, with a V usually uh, in, in German. Then German doesn't allow word final voiced consonants, as I already said. So uh, you might recall um, the way the word lit was actually transcribed um, in the chart. So here we have um, the German word Zeit and the German word Zeit, which are homophones in German. They sound the same. You um, can't hear a difference. Um, and this is true at the end of a word only. So Seite versus Seide, you can make that difference in German, but you can't if it's at the end of a word, it's always non-voiced, it's always unvoiced. So the, the, the underlying D sound uh, here, which might be there, sounds like a T, it's realized as a T in German. Okay, um, that's category one. These are really, really important things um, when dealing with consonants. Then uh, the R is usually a uvular approximant or fricative in German, R, R, or R, um, something like that, depending on your accent of German, of course. It might also be a, a, a trilled R in some accents of German. Um, coda R is unsounded in most German accents nowadays. So German is, is non-rhotic. German pronunciation is non-rhotic. Compare this um, with uh, a non-rhotic accent of English. So uh, the second syllable in beta, if I pronounce that the RP way, um, is very similar to the second syllable in the German corresponding word besser. 
right? Um, the transcription would be a little bit different. You have a slightly different schwa-like sound there in German, but it's almost the same sound. Um, so you don't say besser or anything like that. So maybe an, a non-rhotic accent like RP um, is really easy uh, for Germans or comparatively easy for Germans to sort of imitate um, than roticity will be. Okay, the L is always realized as clear L in German. So compare the two words milk and milch, right? You have a L sound there in German that you don't really hear in English. In English, um, particularly at the end of a syllable, you have an O sound there or even a completely vocalized OO-like sound, right? So English, in English, you can hear both milk and milk actually and this even the dark l will might sound like a vowel it might sound more like an u uh, to germans who hear it um, so milch the, l, the, the that typical um l sound that you get at the end of a syllable in german you don't really hear like that in english but this is category two these are things that are maybe not so important then um when dealing with vowels, we have some things in category one that I already mentioned. Uh, so there is no a ah sound in German like that. Um, so English sad versus English said might actually sound the same perceptually to a native speaker of German. Um, just like the German words enden and endern actually do begin with the same sound, right? So Germans are used to not hearing um, the difference between a and e or e. Uh, like that. Another big thing, really, is that E and O are monophthongs in German. They never got diphthongized like in English. So um, compare the vowels in English say uh, with German Z, right? Or compare the English, the vowel in English so or so with the vowel in, uh, in German so. Very different vowels, right? These are monophthongs in German. By the way, I don't really know if this makes the English words very hard to pronounce in German per se, because if you think about it, a sound like A is heard in German. It's not a phoneme of German, but you do have it nowadays in German quite a lot. You have it in interjections, for example, in German. Um, imagine people um, on a soccer field saying, hey, right? <laughs> or imagine people uh, using words like baby um, to one another. Um, hey, baby, right? So if you, um, German language nowadays, particularly youth language, YouTuber language is so full of loan words from English that a sound like A um, comes very natural, I think, to a, an actual speaker of German nowadays. I don't think this is a big problem. Um, o as well. I think O is like that too. Um, so maybe these, these are marginal phonemes in German. They don't really feature in a lot of words, um, but they're there. They're, you, you hear them a lot, actually, in actual German. Um, okay, then some little things. Uh, so I just said compare say with z. It's not only the vowel, it's also the consonant that is different there. Um, but what makes it hard is the spelling, really, because non-final orthographic s is used in German for the z sound, for the voiced um, version of this fricative. And that doesn't really happen like that, or it doesn't happen a lot. In English. So look at the German word Seite, for example, right? Um, on the other hand, and this is what makes it so confusing, German does have the letter Z, right? The last letter of the alphabet. It does exist in German, but it's used for something very different. It's used for the Z affricate, which is very frequent in German. So you have Zeit, for example. Um, in English, tz, I don't think is very frequent. You have it in loan words like tsunami and pizza, but it doesn't really feature that much, I don't think. Okay, but this is something about German spelling, which might also make it hard. And lastly, if we look at some connected speech phenomena, um, there's also another thing where um, 
you can uh, really hear a German accent. Uh, and this is a little bit hard to talk about because it's not really reflected in the spellings, but stressed initial vowels. So if a word begins with a vowel and it's a stressed word in a sentence, stressed initial vowels are typically preceded by a glottal stop in German. So compare what um, these two phrases, auf einmal and all of a sudden, um, typically sound like. In German, you really have a break, um, so to speak. Um, a, a, the, the glottis closes and then opens again at the beginning of these words, auf einmal. In English, um, all of a sudden, the first three syllables there might actually sound pretty much like the name Oliver, right? So Oliver, it's just sort of drawn together and you don't have, so to say that with a German accent, you would have to say all, all of a sudden, right? For example, that would be, that would make this a very German pronunciation of that. Or the, the example given in the book is the number 81. 81 in German, 81. Really with a uh sound there in front of 80. Um, and this doesn't happen in English like that. So a phrase, uh, a comparable phrase maybe um, would typically be sort of drawn together more, an apple, um, not really an apple like that. Um, you would really uh, pronounce that uh, differently and without these glottal stops um, at the beginning there. Okay, um, that was it right now, and here are my references. <laughs>